When I was like, I don't know, 10 years old, I played a game called Black and White, which allowed me to fulfill my God complex by being God. I remember biking to my friend's house where he'd pop in the disc and we'd watch in awe, glued to the CRT monitor, at the sheer graphical magic that was this game. But when I'd go home and load this up on my parents' PC, all the textures would load in incorrectly and I'd be looking at what seemed to be a melting pink hellscape. Because my boomer parents loved coal power, built everything out of asbestos, and refused to upgrade our Windows 97 PC going deep into the 2000s. In any case, I would play a benevolent god because it was easier to explain to your parents when they would inevitably walk in while you were playing. Unlike in, for example, GTA Vice City, where when you're not benevolent your parents would walk in as you were doing the hanky-panky with a hooked individual in a side alley somewhere. If only they knew what their dear child would then do to that individual to get all their money back. Speaking of weird small children, this kid is upset that his parents brought him along to the beach to watch while they too do the hanky-panky in front of him. Honestly, really odd behavior from the parents, and in a completely reasonable fashion, their child decides to take his own life via shark mauling. There's probably an easier, more practical solution though, child. For example, have you considered killing your parents? Haha. <laughs> That's just naughty. The parents pray to the heavens and somewhere in the cosmos a new god is born. If only they knew that this god was tired of being benevolent. My parents can't stop me from being a naughty boy in video games anymore. I name myself Pigma because I pig my villages up and I throw them. Just joking. My name is Generous God. Only these people don't know what kind of generosity this refers to. For example, once I am done spinning my camera around to convince the old tutorial man in my head that I'm capable of learning how to rotate the camera, I very generously hurl the required 3,000 units of wood at my incomplete temple, which also happens to be in the general direction of my worshippers. This brings to light a philosophical dilemma. If you're a generous God, is it also generous if you're generous with your cruelty? I like bread. This lady called Sable challenges me to open this wooden gate which leads to a magical land. Child's play. What? She explains that unless I can find three gate stones, I'll be unable to cross the gates into Narnia or whatever. The first gate stone you see right at the start where you spawn in. I place this and Sable waves her cubes around excitedly. The second is hidden in this house, but this feminine polygon won't give it to me unless I find her brother, who happens to have wandered off and tripped balls on some shrooms in the wilderness. Also, he is now dying. Observe. <coughs> Don't do drugs, kids. The two halves of my consciousness, Albus Dumbledore and Danny DeVito, argue about whether I should help the lady or trash her house to get the keystone. Luckily for her, I am a generous god. I gently place her brother on the ground. I then smash her house open anyway. There's a lesson to be learned in all this. Nothing is free. Thank you for your benevolence. You're welcome. Let's kill him! The third gate stone was destroyed aeons ago, so we have to bring a suitable rock to the village sculptor, who happens to be the most punchable man in all of my kingdom. I'm definitely the best sculptor in the village. I resist the urge to launch this punchable man into the stratosphere. We need him to get past the gates to Wakanda, so I settle for sculpting his home with the quarry stone. While we wait for the gate stone to be made, I create a couple disciples, one to build and the other to breed. Efri Mavrakakis is now the village concubine. All the lineage associated with my people from now on will have a single common ancestor, she who births my kingdom. Observe, as she hovers around the building site, searching for a strong working man, it would appear she has a type. With the final gate stone in place, Sable believes it is now her right to permit generous God to travel the gates into the land beyond, where we are faced with a choice. Which creature do we wish to be our avatar? Dumbledore thinks it should be the intelligent cow. Danny DeVito likes the ferocious tiger. A strong and noble beast, not the fierce lethal tiger. All I can think about is how I'll be disposing of Sable. Anyway, I choose the monkey because Dick's out for Harambe. From this day forward, he shall be known as Monkey Jesus. Sable, believing it is still her duty to tell me what to do makes me do some menial tasks in order to train monkey Jesus, such as stroke the monkey, spank the monkey, observe the demons hiding behind the eyes of monkey. He is off to a good start because he immediately tries to throw Sable out of his pen. Sable tells me to punish him to avoid him doing things like this again in the future, but I dislike Sable. In all seriousness, we will need monkey Jesus on his best behavior to contrast my otherwise morally questionable behavior. Ooh, now that was close. How dare this villager comment on my throwing skills. In order to lull the villagers into a false sense of security, I have happy smiley faces tattooed onto Monkey Jesus, so that the people feel nothing but a warm comfort in his presence. You see, though he Thanos snaps this sheep out of existence, it is to provide for the tribe, while I, their god, abandoned them because I found an incomplete circle of musical stones. 
I am a simple god. Shaggy from Scooby-Doo asks me to complete the circle. So over a number of days, I go on a totally not superficial journey to find the various stones, some of which are duds. On my journey, I find definitely the best sculptor in a village, but he is having a mental breakdown and walking out to the ocean, presumably to end his life via shark mauling. I'm definitely the best sculptor. This village really has issues. So I do what any loving god would do and give him super aids. Nah, nah, you can't do that in this game. So I drop him down a mountain. I can still hear his screams. I place his corpse in the creche to give the children something to talk about in the morning. And I return the final musical stone to the circle. I wake up Stoner Johnson by dropping a rock on his house. Which is apparently bad karma, Guru. But here in my kingdom, there's no karma. Only vibes. A terrible accident happens and now he's crippled. But that's okay because now he can serve as an example to Ephimaphrakakis's two dozen children. About what happens when you smoke the devil's lettuce. Now I know what you're thinking. Best guest, I'm digging the naughty boy god thing, but man, I just want to see Monkey Jesus' story arc. Well, my most esteemed viewer, that's what happens next. Because other than feeding Sable to him and then him vomiting her back up, based Monker plays with a beach ball. He helps out some drowning villagers. He shits against our temple, while I try to assist these jovial would-be sailors with the task of rebuilding their boat. Eventually, by my godly powers, they're able to set sail. Goodbye, my seamen. Anyway, with each task Monkey Jesus completes, his personality takes more of an angelic shape. And some of these tasks, when completed, grant us with what is referred to as a one-shot miracle. A type of spell you as a god can cast, but only once. The stone circle gave us a food miracle. Helping the seamen gave us miracle rain. And saving the drowning villagers granted us the creature strength miracle. However, instead of just casting these for the benefit of the village, I save them for later. There's not really much that's happened until this point. Nothing that has really challenged us. But one day things change. This pathetic mortal tells us that Yogi Bear has come to visit and it has terrified the villagers. This guy is absolutely yoked. We're all dead! Even the spirits! Dead! You two boys! He asks to speak to Monkey Jesus to teach us the secrets of being a god. Although it does look like he is partaking of the forbidden leaf. Who am I to deny this friendly face? He takes us to a nearby village through the pass and teaches us about the one-shot miracles. Without knowing, I'd already crushed the life from Shaggy and started to stockpile some. Shaggy is probably the one who sold him the devil's lettuce anyway. We cast them in the village, which converts these heretics into fanatical believers, increasing our influence on the land. Monkey Jesus even learns to cast the food miracle just by observing. And as far as I'm aware, he can cast this without consuming a miracle and has his own stamina slash mana resource. The AI in this game always impresses me. When I'm not chucking people down a mountain, and then watching them crawl away in agony, I am busy completing tasks to earn more one-shot miracles in the hopes that I can teach them to monker. One such task is helping this lady who was standing over a corpse in the creche stop Ezra Miller from abducting children and taking them to his rural cavern up in the mountains. To do this, I leash Monkey Jesus up to him to catch him. Help! I'm having a panic attack! Ah! I am presented with a choice. Kill the weirdo or allow him to live. I only wanted a family, but the village women said I was too ugly. Oh, Ezra, you're not ugly. You're just clinically insane. I decide a fate worse than death is for him to survive and serve me for the rest of his days. And our mercy grants us the miracle heal one shot dispenser. For the most part, Monkey Jesus learns from my use of these miracles. But every now and then, when I am demonstrating something really cool, he'll go and take a shit against the village food store instead. Hey, this is the story arc you wanted, so this is what you're gonna get. Yogi Bear wishes to teach us the second lesson. Combat. So we make our way over to this open field where he is forced to go on a diet of condensed fear, shrinking him down to normal size. And much like Monkey Jesus takes a shit on the village store, he takes a shit on the guide. I have made a terrible mistake. No! No! Ah! The guide goes into a recovery coma, and then we waddle on over to this thing. We're told his name is Slag and he's hungry. To get him to go away, we just have to feed him. So we go to town and get some food, delicious gluten. Monkey Jesus then defecates on the offering, which enrages Slag and he picks a fight with us. Unfortunately for him, we deploy our custom tailored martial art, Slapawera, an ancient technique handed down from generation of monkey to generation of monkey. A fighting style centered entirely around slapping the living shit out of someone until they draw the last breath. 
We climb up a mountain to speak with Yogi Bear and learn our final lesson. He teaches us about the Triforce, sorry, the Creeds, which are the source of all godly power. But another god called Ganondorf, Nemesis, who wants to find the three creeds for himself and destroy all the other gods, barbecues Yogi Bear and plunges our world into chaos. A portal rips a new orifice into my kingdom. It's been a long time since Dumbledore Dingleberry has seen a hole this large, so his first thought is to plunge his entire body inside. He's gone through! We establish that on the other side is a whole new kingdom, and that I need to save my people from our doomed world by placing them into the portal. So I plan to do just that. But first I save my superficial items. The miracles I neglected to cast for the benefit of my people. I take the dud music stones because I think they're neat. I take all the food and wood we have in store. I take these two beach balls. I feed monkey Jesus. I watch as he is struck by lightning. Then I start saving my people. Hey, life comes at you fast, kid. I plunge my godly skull deep into the dark and foreboding orifice as any self-respecting and probably lubricated deity would. On the other side, a god called Kazar reveals to us that he brought us through to start a collab against a hostile god called Lettuce. In return for our help, Homeboy sets us up with a workshop which allows us to expand our village. Our primary objective being to destroy the Lettuce. We need to expand in the direction of his territories and convert the villages in between into hamlets devoted to my worship, not his. So I get hard to work doing this dropping shrubbery on children in the wilderness. To be fair, if you were a villager who witnessed this, you would become a believer too. This is one more believer I didn't have before. I have also made the executive decision that I will not be treating Kazak as an ally, but more a stepping stone. Allow me to explain. Kazman, in all his wisdom, has allowed me to interact with things in his territories. Ordinarily, I would not be able to interact with things outside my realm of influence. So I take scaffolding for homes from his village to save on wood. I abduct worshippers from his temple and sacrifice them at mine for prayer power, which allows me to cast miracles. Whenever my food would run low, I would go over to Kakakrabi's village store and simply take all of his. I would be a plague on his realm's resources for reasons none other than to save resources in my realm, to ensure the prosperity of my kingdom of approximately five huts. While I commit these atrocities, Monkey Jesus would offset my rather questionably moral alignment by dancing with the villagers. How benevolent. <laughs> While my villagers sleep on the floor, I use precious scaffolding to build a monument to myself to increase the power of my miracles. I deforest the wilderness nearby for the wood required for construction. And when the forests vanish, I cast miracle wood by taking more of Kazar's disciples for sacrifice, hilariously while he begs for assistance. Between converting villages, I build a row of houses from one settlement to the other nearest to my temple. I do this for reasons none other than vanity. Also, I guess to address the homelessness issues we've been having. No, but really, remember the row. The all-encompassing row. It's really important for later on, remember the row. As we impress the myriad cultures with miracles of both grain and wood, we too partake of other godly behaviors, such as chucking rocks at the nearby villages under Lettuce's control. Do not stray over my- Often can his high-pitched shrieks be heard as we take villages from right under his nose. Villages with alien and horrifying foreign customs, such as offering the children up for sacrifice to the new god. But they do not know their new god. I take what I want. <laughs> It's what they would have wanted after all. I cast this miracle bird spell over Lemon's village, and these villagers have never seen a bird, so now they believe in me as God, which prompts a visit from Nemesis, who happens to spawn it at Kazar's land, Kazakhstan, to assist Lettuce. Normally by now, Kazar has expanded a lot, but obviously I kept his kingdom in a constant state of starvation and economic collapse. So Nemesis has a pretty easy time of burning his seven huts to the ground and eradicating his temple, thus uninstalling our ally from the game. His villagers just walk off mid cutscene. They've had enough of this shit. As it turns out, Kevin Kevin's tortoise had a piece of the Triforce, Creed inside of it, which upon killing, Nemesis commands Lettuce to command his wolf thing to grab it and bring it to him in another world, leaving me in the precarious situation of having no other ally god to latch onto like a parasite for my own benefit. However, Lettuce no longer has his creature with him, leaving mine in theory home free to attack enemy territory. So I cast a miracle of creature growth on Monkey Jesus with the intent of having him smash Lettuce's temple. But instead, much like how his neck gets stuck in his body, he gets stuck between these buildings and starts to kick the shit out of them in frustration. With Operation King Kong no longer viable, I come to the conclusion that my sphere of influence is probably now close enough to his temple that I can just lob rocks at it from the edge. But Lethus cracks the shits and mesmerizes Monkey Jesus through a portal to another world before I can burn his temple to the ground. Obviously, I have grown fond of my creature. The memories of early days of spanking the monkey elicits an emotional response in me. Listen to the emotion in my voice. I decide to give up this world for the next to get Monkey Jesus back, so I make the necessary preparations to depart. Hey, life comes at you fast, kid. 
with the exception of the last few villages which I which I took by force, and with exception of how I treated my ally Kazar, and with exception how I treated his villages, and how I took all of their food, took all of their children from the crash, all their scaffolding, took advantage of their trust. My strength is being set by Lethys. I behaved myself for the most part with dignity and grace. This time around, Litmus has my monkey Jesus, and I'm mad. Remember that row of houses? Yeah, there wasn't any profound reason for it. I just I just knew I'd have to leave one day and I wanted to play Villager Fire Dominoes. Once I'd been satisfied with watching the world burn and taking all of my believers' food with me to the portal, we take the plunge through and look for Monkey Jesus, who is trapped in case in ice and being tortured by Lethus creature. His name is Chugworth, but we need to establish something. Chugworth is a cockroach, and always will be. In order to free my creature, I'll need to convert three towns not including my own. To reach those towns, I need to massively increase my barrier of influence. So I start by forcing my disciples to breed like wild animals, and those who are too old and infertile to bear children would be sent to mass-produce housing. The more disciples and the more homes your settlements have, the further your godly influence will allow you to travel. But I acknowledge that shepherding in an entirely new generation of worshippers is going to take too much time. Fortunately, there's an alternative I'd like to show you. Oh, please don't pick me up. Please don't throw me. This guy is a magical believer. For some reason, the devs coded in a villager who believes in you so hard that you're able to exist outside of your influence so long as it's within a few meters of this man. He also happens to be invincible. Surely you can see where this is going. If I cannot convert towns outside my influence, but I can so long as this guy is there, then I just have to make sure this guy gets there. But for every territory I take, Lettuce throws us a curveball. He sets some villagers on fire and they run towards the village. I put a few of them out, lose my patience, and throw the remaining ones in the ocean. I wiggle this rock around and take this village, and Lettuce sends a pack of wolves towards it. But little does he know, my people are starving, and for those dogs I don't throw away, I chuck this meaty bounty in the village store. The last village is quite far out of my barrier of influence, but as my people breed like rodents to increase this barrier, I take the time to lob fireballs at it. For the more destruction cause makes the people desperate, and desperate people are easy to convert. With enough time to expand, I can now reach the village. But there's not much here anymore. Oops. My strategy of wiggling this rock I stole from Shaggy in World 1 seems to work really well. Because the villagers can't actually see my orange appendage, just a massive floating rock. With the only logical explanation being that there is a god they must now worship. It's only logical. With all these villagers dominated, I free Monkey Jesus from his prison. We're forced to watch this really awkward cutscene of him walking down the hill for some reason. And then once at the bottom, he just straight up dies. Once healed to full health, I start to brainstorm ways to take Lethus' final village. But I notice this absolute cockroach just beelining it towards my temple. There's only one thing to do. I send Monkey Jesus into a near endless series of conflicts with Chugworth while I deploy my grandest plan yet to take the final lettuce village. Wiggle the stone. Really, why other gods don't wiggle the stone is beyond me. Because Lethus doesn't know how to wiggle the stone, he begs me for mercy, surrenders the Triforce, the Creed, and opens a portal to the world where we'll find the second piece. All in exchange for my mercy. Seeing as I've already done a lot of bad before wiggling the stone, such as microwaving his doggy, burning his villages alive, beating up his doggy, perhaps it is now time for mercy is what I would say if I weren't an enormous piece of shit. I burn his temple to the ground as retribution for what he did to Monkey Jesus. It's as they say, keep your friends close, but keep your enemies be- be de destroy your enemies. You have taken everything from me! Sag, I make preparations to enter the portal in the fourth world. Life comes at you fast, kid. World 4 is absolutely munted, a wasteland with fire raining from the skies. But Old Man Santa reminds us that those were the gates to Wakanda, and we're actually at the place of our origin. It turns out this land is cursed and my village is struggling. To heal this land, a sussy bucker who knows more than he should tells us that we have to get the Guardian Stones from a stinky ogre, from under a spiritual shield, and something something Old Man has the last one and we need to reunite him with his long lost wife. It's all, it's all very touching really. First things first, I cast Miracle Shield around what remains of my village. So sustained by virtually the entire suffering town population. And I send Monkey Jesus over to Stinky Ogre Johnson, who, as it appears, is Slag, son of Slag. You remember that one guy we brought an offering of food only for Monkey Jesus to then poo on that food? Yeah, this guy is his son. But Monkey Jesus stands there with a goddamn rock, ready to throw down. 
Slag gets clobbered and set on fire. His strategy of exclusively punching Monkey Jesus in the groin is ineffective. Monkey Jesus's groin is invincible. <laughs> That's one part of the curse sorted. The lightning storm has come to an end, but the Australian summer persists. The next step is to lift the spiritual barrier, but Monkey Jesus must defecate. He lets rip on the spiritual barrier and the barrier is lifted. Just kidding, that didn't work. I have to play a memory game to lift the barrier. And because I'm not a toddler and can remember a sequence of up to nine steps, despite various levels of inebriation, I get the second guardian stone, which puts to an end the spicy rain. That's all well and good, but with the red sky still looming, my villagers are too afraid to fulfill their lordly duties to me, such as work the fields, deforest the land, and have loads of babies. That's right. It has been years of celibacy because the sky is a little bit orange. The people do not partaketh of the joys of the flesh because it's a bit nippy outside, in it, A bit red, in it. To bring back the blue sky, I need to reunite this old man who is upsetty spaghetti because Nemesis separated him from his wife, whose name is Kiko. And this is where my journey comes to a grinding halt. You see, in black and white, you can press a button to turn on seeing the various names of villages around the island. I figured, okay, turn on nameplates, find Kiko, have Monkey Jesus take Kiko to Sad Man, Sad Man gives me the Guardian Stone, problem solved, curse lifted. And then I can find the second piece of the Triforce, the second piece of the Creed. But I did this for the whole island and I found no such NPC named Kiko. So I decide I'll just take on some time and she'll turn up at some point, then take her to her husband. Easy peasy, right? So I help this guy who was flagged as 22 years of age but has the body of a child do some fishing. Between the first meeting and completing this task, which took maybe five minutes, he transforms into a middle-aged man. A village is gonna village. I help this woman who wants to take a healing potion to her brother in the nearby village. But she has to pass through a treacherous valley set up like a Monty Python skit. There's wolves, which I convert into food for the village. A local forest fire, which I make no longer local. And an ogre throwing rocks, whom I set on fire. And get Monkey Jesus to uninstall him. She eventually gets back to her village where we see her brother limping out with leprosy or something. She gives him the healing potion which heals him, herself, and some homeless person sitting on the floor next to them. Mission accomplished, but still no signs of Kiko. So I just loiter around the kingdom, fixing up villages and watching Monkey Jesus demonstrate to the disciple breeders what they're meant to be doing. In, out, in, out. Power thrust. It's about the motion of the ocean. Ooh, ooh, ah, ah. <laughs> Feeling like giving up, I decide the most respectful thing to do near Yogi Bear's remains is to lob rocks at the man's hut in hopes that perhaps one lands and I can get a free kill for the Guardian Stone. But no luck. I take a long shot. I find this woman who seems sick. She lacks a nameplate, but it's worth a shot. I hand the lady to Monkey Jesus and have him walk over to the man's hut. But nothing happens. So I have him walk all the way up the mountain as well, near the hut. But also nothing happens again. He just stands there staring at me, his eyes piercing my godly outer shell, penetrating me, looking into my soul. His skull also appears to be made out of jelly. Being that I cannot locate a single person for some reason, I have failed as a god. I react accordingly and built a wonder for myself. These take a long time and a lot of material, so I spam cast miracle wood, but keep running out of prayer power. So I figure I should just grab that sick person and convert them into mana, you know, just in case the sickness spreads or something. And it turns out, Yup, that NPC was Kiko. You've killed my soulmate. <laughs> Whoops. With a man's hopes and dreams crushed, the third guardian stone is secured. The curse of the blood red sky comes to an end and the island is restored. In theory, that is it. We've restored the island to the way it was. Our villagers are thriving and Monkey Jesus can shrink back down for some reason and go to sleep in his pen at peace, satisfied with what he's done for the day. However, there's still one more curse to be lifted. In short, this village went from being good boys to skelly boys. This has made them a bit sad because there's no getting off the skelly train. Guy with Asmongold's hairline tells us that if we can lift the curse, they will tell us where the second piece of the Triforce, the Creed is on this island. So I send Monkey Jesus waddling over to the village. He initially tries to free them with the language of his body. But what we really need to do is lift both of these ominous skull totems at the same time. And despite being a god, I am just one hand, not two. So I need Monkey Jesus to lift one while I lift the other in unison. Initially, I'm quite disheartened to see that he will only poo against the totem. All he does is poo. 
You see, he's actually not that big. His growth has been stunted by his diet on World 3, which consisted of mostly lightning and suffering. So I'm concerned he may be too small to lift this. But after a few tries of him walking away from it for no reason, being a naughty monkey, he lifts the totem, which cleanses these people of their curse. It's clear I'm in a cutscene, but hilariously enough, an NPC goes from being a skeleton to not a skeleton, and then turns into a skeleton again as they die of old age or something. I'm convinced this is unintended and I'm just hashtag blessed. Please comment. Live, love, laugh, best guest. Hashtag blessed. I love you, daddy. Spank the monkey. It is revealed to us that the second piece of the creed is inside what remains of Yogi Bear's rotting corpse. Monkey Jesus is no stranger to dumpster diving and unashamedly grabs it. He's a good monkey. I need to remember to stroke the monkey later. Nemesis rudely interrupts me and opens another gaping orifice on this island and challenges me to a duel on the other side. Being that this is presumably the final challenge. A hand monkey Jesus an ungodly amount of food for him to consume. And watch on as he rapidly expands. This frightens the villagers. From this day forward he shall be known as Chonka Monka. I make the final preparations to leave. Life comes at you fast kid and plunge my large orange fist deep into this cavernous portal. Mmm. Mmm, yes. On the other side, Nemesis is telling us something I am sure is very ominous and foreboding, but I am much more distracted by how violently my worshippers and possessions cross over into this world. Same deal as the last worlds, for us to defeat Nemesis, we'll have to take the villages between our temple and his with the ultimate goal of the destruction of his temple, which we now have a very chunky monkey for. But Nemesis sends one of his little ass goblins to curse him. Poor guy was just chillin' and now he's a lump of very fat on the ground. With nothing immediately happening, we keep an eye on Chunky Monkey, but he seems fine for now. So I work on expanding our influence to reach the next town. I force various villagers to make it their sole purpose to be a sex worker in the village, and expand our population, and send the Chonka down to the next village to do his part in impressing them. But all he wants to do is sit his fat ass down and rest. This is undesirable behavior, so I give him a gentle smack on the bottom. I'm prompted he will rest less, and he just stands there looking at me. I can tell this is going to be a long campaign. Antonio Banderas from the hit 90s movie Zorro is hiding in the woods and tells us a little bit about the curse. It turns out that each wonder in the towns controlled by Nemesis contribute to the curse, and we will need to destroy them to prevent Chonka from becoming weak, small, and evil alignment. I really don't fancy dealing with a monkey Satan because I need him to offset my morally dubious behavior, but I figure if we expand we'll be able to reach these towns in no time. I start by creating scaffolds to build up our low budget housing suburbs so that the mass produced babies of the tribe will have somewhere to live. Chonka casts miracle water on the shrubbery for wood, and also drenches this homeless villager who just wants to sleep on the floor. He's becoming evil. There is just one problem though. We massively lack in wood to support the new building projects and we lack the miracle wood spell. This means the deforestation of the local woods and this means that all the remaining wood is outside my sphere of influence and thusly unattainable. My last resort is to forcefully take the next village by sending Chunky over there with a rock that he can wiggle. But every time I prompt him to pick it up, he just looks at it. All he wants to do is stand there on the outskirts and boogie with the people. And for some reason, this doesn't even make them believe in me. They just think this massive monkey crawled out of the forest to hang out with them and do the devil's lettuce or something for no reason. Unfortunately, as the strategy fails and time goes on, Chonka Monka is ravaged by the full effects of the curse, at least the part of it that shrinks him. However, for some reason, this almost human-sized monkey is somehow more impressive to these people than the chunky dancing version, but he's still not impressive enough and time's running out. I decide to weaponize the tiny monkey and send him to the nearest wonder to destroy. I think you can easily sum up this game by watching him scurry up this hill, then try to poo on the wonder that I have ordered him to destroy, while Nemesis friendly fires his own town by throwing fireballs at us. This angers the tiny monkey who then kicks the building apart. This is the authentic god gaming experience. Anyway, Nemesis goes full three head and uses a mega blast miracle on our creature, which also obliterates the town center, which has massive ramifications. A town's level of belief in you is tied to the village center, meaning he has relinquished most control of the town, and it is now easy to convert. Watching as all that remains of my monkey is a smiley face at the bottom of a crater, I believe I've come up with the best strategy for domination. I send our tiny monkey to each town. He isn't well versed in warfare, but he still eventually kicks buildings and then burns them down, though sometimes he does also set fire to himself. Stupid monkey. Sending who was once dubbed Monkey Jesus for his kindness into towns outside of our influence to become the instrument of our destruction is hilarious. But for all our efforts, it turns out we actually can't destroy these wonders to break the curse. We actually need to convert the towns. So we're back again at square one. So I send him back to the nearest town to ours to convert them. And we're for the first time encountered by Nemesis creature. Big pussy. Look at the steel and tiny monkey's eyes. He is at peace. Resolved.
We engage Big Pussy, who happens to also be called Chugworth for some reason. Monkey G's is starch strong, erect at the spine, but Big Pussy is larger, and we are too small. Big Pussy gobbles us up. In the end, we both end up on fire and Tiny goes down. I send Tiny orange human-sized monkey back to the village. Big Pussy seems to have left. Tiny monkey poops against the small villager who understandably starts to pass away and die. And as Monkey Jesus turns to heal them, they die anyway. But this profound gesture is enough to convert the first village. Big success. Remember the nearby village where Nemesis three-headed nuked the town center to kill our creature? Well, my influence can now reach it. I notice there's no villages there. So I go a full five head and drop a couple believers there, which converts the villages. You see, because Nemesis wiped out the whole town, dropping two of my own villages there to inhabit it means they outvote the zero Nemesis followers. That's one third of the curse neutralized. Elsewhere, my tiny monkey is now trying to impress another settlement outside the reach of my influence. And while he is there, I come to the realization that the remaining final two villages aside are massively in favor of believing in Nemesis. Meaning his own reach of influence is starting to encroach on my towns, leaving me vulnerable. And we've established already that for influence to expand, you need people and homes. Which means now my strategy has changed yet again to removing people and homes. This buys me some time to focus on small orange human-sized monkey because all he does in my absence is poo and contort previously undiscovered geometric shapes out of his head mesh. When I can stop him from continuously evacuating his bowels, he works on actually casting miracles and we take another village. That's two wonders taken and two parts of the curse broken. But Monkey Jesus is still tiny. So I work on massively expanding my towns nearest to Nemesis Final 2, which increases my influence over to his nearest village. But with 2,163 belief needed to convert, that's quite the mountain to climb. In context, one miracle will net you an average 20 to 50 belief. And that costs prayer power, which takes a long time to generate. However, if you wiggle the big stone in town, very impress. Believe in God now. I am a genius. Why won't Nemesis wiggle the stone? This makes Nemesis go full ape mode and start throwing these various assorted polygons around. And Antonio Banderas from the hit 90s movie Zorro stops tripping out on these mushrooms in the wilderness to let us know that our stone wiggling skills have captured all the wonders and lifted the curse on Monkey Jesus, returning him to his former glory, albeit without the massive weight gain we previously gave him. Anyway, Nemesis starts casting Mega Blast all around the map, and my new village is most certainly in a firing line. We're well and truly deep within Nemesis' boundary of influence as well. But surely I can protect this town. As it turns out, I could not. I realize that trying to work against the onslaught of attacks is not going to work. Because for some reason, Big Pussy is now Huge Pussy, and Huge Pussy would most definitely dominate Monkey Jesus. Nemesis has seemingly infinite prayer power and a limitless supply of small peen energy to tap into. And I don't have the power to truly stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with him. But I do have a brain where Nemesis does not. Acknowledging that I'd not be able to sustainably expand many villages much further, and that my settlements currently are too far away from his final one, I assess the Mega Blast attacks. They all follow a straight line trajectory, a strategy only the most three-headed god would come up with. There are a few pockets of space near his town that are safe, and I choose here. I start to make another town completely separate from the ones on the map already, and I turn Nemesis' gaze to Monkey Jesus, who would fight valiantly on the front lines. The more damage he would cause in Nemesis' towns, the more Nemesis would be distracted, and the more I could build up our new village unnoticed. As the village expands, the farther my influence widens, and I plunge my large, unlubricated god hand into Nemesis' Nemesis' backlines, causing more and more destruction and reducing his power. You see, my strategy now isn't going to be to wiggle the stone. No, that would be far too difficult. And there's no way that I, with my attention divided over several villages, have any chance of converting his village which he now focuses on. Except there is. My strategy now is to reduce his believer population to zero, and then place a single villager of mine in the town to convert it. Kenshiro <laughs> My safe word is pineapple juice. Oh, watch your hand, boy! You have no. Be strong. With his village now totally deserted, I place my singular follower, 
and remind this villager that I still exist by wiggling the stone to convert the town. Because one villager is equal to or more than zero villagers, nemesis, you moron. But to become the final god, we must now destroy our enemy who challenges us to a duel. He berates our creature who is for some reason on fire in the cutscene, and takes his glorious massive pussy with a proven track record of kicking my ass, and debuffs it into the mirror image of Monkey Jesus. A weird evil purple monkey goblin. Monkey Satan! Monkey Jesus walks up to him, all like, ooh ooh. Ah, ah, ah. And the final battle commences. We are both immediately engulfed in flames. This is a bad time. But this also works to my benefit. You see, the gimmick to this fight is that Monkey Satan will continuously be healed when his health gets low. Until eventually he just doesn't. But with us both taking fire damage, I put out Monkey Jesus and then force him to defend in a corner. This confuses Monkey Satan. And the more he's confused, the more his health goes down. And the more my health doesn't go down. You see, if I get his health to zero before my health gets to zero, then I win. It's so easy. Our five head strategy ends with the butt goblin croaking. Monkey Jesus then gives us a very uncomfortable side eye in victory. Stop that, Monkey Jesus. We have done it. We're victorious. Is what I would say if Dumbledore hadn't revealed to us that the third Triforce, the third Creed, is within our creature. And that to finish Nemesis once and for all, the Creeds need to be destroyed too. But this would mean the death of Monkey Jesus. So we're presented with a very difficult choice. I'm going to miss you, buddy. Be brave. <laughs> Fortunately, this was all a fever dream, an outer body experience. Monkey Jesus returns to us. And so I leave you with some parting words I think he, the hero of the day, would want you to hear. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Monkey. <laughs>